Let's talk about Clash of Corgis, a card game that's really three games in one. Welcome to Brains on Games. I'm Dr. Brian McDonald. In this episode, we're going to talk about a game. Well, it's a deck of cards that really allows you to play three different games. It was a game that was sent to me by Derek, the designer, uh, a while back. A game called Clash of Corgis. Now, look at this small box. This could fit in your pocket. You can bring it with you when you go to a restaurant or wherever you want to go. Uh, this is a game for between two and four players. The box says kids, kids age 13 and up can play this game, but much younger kids can figure out certainly the base game here. Uh, the, the final one that we're going to talk about is a little bit more complicated, but games only take 10 to 20 minutes to play. Let's take a deeper look at Clash of Corgis. All three Clash of Corgis games are light in terms of their complexity, so there's nothing too complicated for you to figure out. Like I said, the final version, the, the final rule set has some complications that maybe the older kids would prefer that one over the younger ones. I'll talk about each of these games in turn, but like I said, all of them are light, so we'll go from the original base game, then we'll talk about Treasure Island, and then the final rule set is called Capture the Illusionist. So we're really going to do three videos in one, as well as talking about three games in one. The original base game, Clash of Corgi's game is one where, well, it's a climber and a shedder. So I've talked about climbers and shedders before. That's a kind of trick-taking game where it's not so much the suit maybe that matters. Certainly in Clash of Corgi's, the suits don't matter as much as the numbers on the cards. So with climbers, you need to play cards that are higher or more powerful than the ones that have been played previously. And what you're trying to do in a shedder is be the first one to get rid of all of your cards. You're going to start the base Clash of Corgis game with 12 cards in your hand and then you're trying to play a card into the middle of the table or multiple cards into the middle of the table. So you might start uh, if you only have single cards, maybe you're trying to get rid of your single cards first because they're going to be the easiest to drop at the beginning of a round. So if you start with a single card, other players have to play a single card that's higher than this one. Eventually, as the numbers get higher, there are certain combinations of cards that can beat a single or maybe a pair of wild cards, for example. Uh, so you, you might be playing three of a kind, four of a kind, or even five of a kind. Uh, and, and that's not so hard because each suit has that wild card that can count as any number. So you're not playing runs. You have to play like single cards or pairs or three of a kind, as I said. So you might find yourself playing, oh, if I had a couple of threes and a wild card, I could put those three down on the table and then you need a three of a kind in order to beat it, but it has to have higher numbers than three. Now the added, like what makes this different from other climbers and shedders is that each card number, each rank, has some power or ability. So in the case of a three, if I play threes, whether they're singles or pairs or however many threes I play, this three will allow me to draw a card from the top of the deck and discard one of my cards so that I can maybe create some, some larger sets that will be harder for the other players to beat. The round's going to end when the other players can no longer play cards that are higher. So if everyone else passes, now my triple threes have won the game or have won that round. And then we start again with the single card. The winner of that round is going to be the one who leads maybe a single card. Maybe they have another pair in their hand or three of a kind. Now, if instead a player plays, say, five, say I had three fives in my hand, that's going to beat the threes. What the five forces the next player to do is whatever cards they play have to include a card that's the same suit as one of the cards that I've, one of these fives that I've played in the round. So there are some take that abilities in the game. And there's an ace where if you happen to have an ace, you can show everybody the ace. You put it face up in front of you in your field and the ace is like a nope card. It allows you to cancel the ability uh, of another player's card play. Some of the other powers force players to skip their turns or force players to take a card from their hand and put it in the field in front of them. And that is an interesting element of the game too because you've got your hand of cards and eventually you might have some cards that are face up in front of you in that field. I can't play, I can't combine cards from my hand with cards in the field, but I have to get rid of both the cards in my hand and the cards in the field in order to finish the round of the game. So uh, I'm, I might 
be forced to, I don't know, put some threes down in front of me. And if I've got two threes in my hand and one in the field, I can't combine those. I'm going to have to play that single three just as a separate card play, maybe early in a round if I happen to win uh, a, another round and I get to lead that hand. So the base game of Clash of Corgis is kind of a traditional climber and shedder. You're only looking at matching cards. You're not looking at runs like a 3-4-5. You can't play a 3-4-5. It all has to be the same card with the tricky parts being added, the unique parts of the game being that you've got a combination of a hand and face-up cards in front of you and each card play is going to activate some power or ability. Treasure Island is a completely different game from the, the base Clash of Corgis game. And in Treasure Island, how you win, you're not trying to get rid of all of your cards. In Treasure Island, you win by collecting 10 loot cards. So you have to d defeat some cards from the deck in order to collect loot. And I'll show you how that's done. Players in Treasure Island are going to start with a three card hand. And at the beginning of their turn, they draw a fourth card. Then they have the option of playing one card face up in front of them and that's going to be what creates their party. So if I play a nine like this, uh, now I've got a party with strength nine. Your party can have a maximum of two cards. So here I've played an eight, so I've got a total of 17. Now at some point, I'm going to want to collect some loot. So to do that, I've got to decide to fight. So that's an optional part of your turn and to fight I declare oh I'm gonna fight against one two or three enemies so say I decide well I think with the 17 I can probably beat two cards I'm going to flip these cards over oh and I flipped an ace so an ace is equal to 10 and that means I've tied here so with an with a tie the defenders are going to win I'm gonna lose this hand and I'm not going to collect any loot now if instead I had played uh, instead of the 8, maybe I replace it with this wild card. The wild card is also worth 10. So now I've got a total of 19. That's going to beat these two cards. But something special happens when I play two cards of the same suit into my party. And in this case, I get to add 10 to the total value of my party. So now instead of just a 19, I've got a 29 that's going to beat almost anything from this deck. And I maybe I would have declared three if I had both of those cards. And now I've won a battle against three enemies. I collect these cards as loot. And now I've got three loot. Remember, you need to get a total of 10 in order to win the game. So clearly this game is a lot different from the Climber and Shedder rule set of, of the original Clash of Corgis rules. But there is one thing that's similar between Treasure Island and Clash of Corgis. And that is... Each time I play a card in front of me into my party, that card has some ability and it's going to affect the game. So it's possible that I might be able to uh, choose a card from my opponent's hand. And if it's above or below a certain number, uh, I might get to force him to discard that card. Uh, I might get to force him to discard a, the highest card in his party. I might get to steal loot from another player, depending on what card I play. So as you're adding cards to your party, each time you make that play, some ability is going to kick in. There's a lot of take that involved in the Treasure Island version of Clash of Corgis, and you really need to have that in order to prevent a player from running away with the game. Once somebody's got eight uh, loot cards in front of them, you want to start targeting that player and trying to steal those cards from them, even if that's not the strongest play for your own party. Capture the Illusionist is a completely different beast from the other rules. I've never played a, game, a memory game like this before, and it is very much a memory game. Uh, and I will say that this was the biggest hit with my opponent. So I was playing with my nephew, who's in high school. He loved this game. He's, this is not just his favorite Clash of Corgis game. This was one of his favorite games. He said, oh, this is my favorite card game. I haven't played it. He really, really liked it. Now, he has a good memory, so he's pretty good at it, but he really quite enjoyed it. Clash of Corgis, the, the Capture the Illusionist rule set of the game. So it is a two-player game. Each player is going to take all the cards from a single suit. So you're going to have 11 cards. You've got the 1 to 9, the Ace, and then you've got the Wild card, the one with the star on it. That's the Illusionist. What you're trying to do in this game is find your opponent's Illusionist twice. So you've, you've got to force them to reveal their Illusionist twice, and then you're going to win you're going to take those 11 cards and at random, you're going to shuffle those up and deal them out face down in front of you. 
in two rows of four. That's going to leave you with three cards in your hand that you can see, but these are all face down. So I don't even know where my illusionist is when this game starts. So my opponent's trying to find him. I might be trying to find him too, so that I kind of know what I'm doing uh, as I play through the game. Each turn starts with a peek at one of your face down cards. So I can take a look at what this card is without showing my opponent. In this case, it's a four. Uh, and then I've got to remember, okay, my four is there. After that, you need to take an action. And you do that by either using a card that's already face up or by turning a card face up and then rotating it to show that you've played it. So you do have to rotate those cards because you can't use the same card on every turn. So now this is turned sideways. On my next turn, it's not available. It needs to rest. And then I turn it back right side up after my next turn is done. Now I might, instead of using that four, play a card from my hand face up here at the bottom. Now this card, this number one, I, I probably would want to use that early in the game. What does this number one allow me to do? Well, if I rotate the one, it allows me to peek at a second face down card. So I'm trying to figure out where all of my cards are. This gives me a, an extra peek, but then I do get to activate another card after that. So I could play my one face up, then I could play my four. The four force, forces my opponent to flip over one of his front row cards and reveal it. If it happens to be the illusionist, now I have a chance to capture that card. So on my turn, maybe I've peeked at a second card, so I know, maybe I, I realize that, oh, let me flip this one over. Okay, oh, there's my ace. So now I know the ace is there. This would stay face down, but I'll, I'll leave it face up just so that we remember where it is. Then I could force my opponent to reveal one of his front row cards. Then my opponent gets their turn. They're going to do the very same thing and try to find my illusionist. Now maybe my opponent is going to force me to reveal one of my back row cards, for example. I'd probably reveal the ace, because I then I know I'll remember where the ace is. But if instead I chose to flip over another card, maybe my opponent would find my illusionist. I have one chance to save the illusionist, and I would do that by taking this ace and discarding it. So I get rid of the ace. I can't save the illusionist a second time, but I, I need to do something now in, in order to kind of obscure what's where my cards are from my opponent. How do I do that? Well, the illusionist has an ability to, if I use that card instead of the others, I get to take two, I, I, my opponent has to reveal one of his face down cards, and then I get to take two of my face down cards, shuffle them up with the illusionist and put them back into the same position. So again, neither me nor my opponent is going to know where the illusionist is, but they can narrow it down to three different positions. And that's where it becomes kind of a shell game at that point, because now, oh, there's, I know where the illusionist was, but now it's shuffled up and it's in one of these three spots. All of these cards now are face down. How am I going to find him a, a second time? You can't rescue the illusionist a second time. You only have one ace that you can discard. Now, in the one of the games that I played, I, I was peeking. I, I used a strategy of peeking in columns because I thought, okay, well, it might be easier for me to remember. I know this column has a four and an illusionist. This column has an eight and an ace. So I was peeking in columns. I found where my ace was. It was in the first two cards that I had peeked at. So when my opponent found my illusionist, I, I hadn't known where the illusionist card was, so I had to discard a, that ace to rescue him. If the ace is not revealed, if it's still face down, I can discard it. Now maybe I know where that ace is, maybe I don't. I could just dis flip over a card at random, and if it happens to be the ace, then I've saved the illusionist. But if it's not, I have to take all of my cards, shuffle them all up, and then I start all over again. What skills are you practicing, though, when you play those Clash of Corgis games? Well, there's not a lot of memory involved when we're talking about the Climber and Shedder from the original rule set. Maybe you want to remember those cards that have been played previously because sometimes you can use an ability that will have you say, oh, I think I'm going to pull a high card or a low card from my opponent's hand. That, so there is some memory uh, aspect to that rule set of the game, but you are kind of often trapped by uh, being forced to play those higher cards, and you only have so many options uh, when we're talking about pairs and three of a kind and four of a kind. Memory really is the major component 
of the Capture the Illusionist rule set of the game. We are really trying to peek at these cards and remember which card is which, either to use that card's ability or to make sure that I don't accidentally reveal my Illusionist to my opponent. I need to find where the Illusionist is and where the Ace is and remember where those cards are. So that is visual memory, but there's also a spatial memory component to it as well because I'm not just remembering the card, I'm remembering the location of the card. So we are talking about a spatial span kind of an exercise and then you know once you start doing the shell game of using the illusionist to shuffle things around it does become quite complicated. You're not just remembering which card was where but when was it there. Otherwise you're going to find yourself trapped and revealing the wrong thing. Math reasoning is really an important component of the Treasure Island rule set of the game because I mean you are doing that simple calculation of adding the two numbers in your party based on the ranks of those cards then sometimes you have to add something extra depending on whether your the, the cards in the suit match uh, you know are, are you going to be able to add 10 to your total or double your whatever it might be so there's a little bit of math there but the quantitative reasoning reasoning about quantities the quantitative reasoning part really that's complex here is that you're you're working on the probability of being able to with those two cards capture as many cards as possible that are going to add up to a lower total than yours so there is some that's where the quantitative reasoning comes in it's when you're pushing your luck like that you've got a total and how many cards are am i going to be able to turn over without reaching or exceeding that total that is a you know a bit of a more advanced quantitative reasoning skill I would say of course you can guess and sometimes it's really easy to guess if you've got that extra 10 on top oh I've I've got a 29 here I can draw three cards and it's unlikely that I'm going to get a 29 or a 30 by drawing three cards but it's it is made tricky by the fact that the aces and the wild cards are both worth 10 so there are lots of extra 10s in the deck that you wouldn't otherwise have to worry about um, so that does make it an interesting I think uh, math reasoning exercise final thoughts though about these three clash of corgis games well I, I did like the shell game and the memory component of Treasure Island like that was unique I'd never played a game like that before I mean I played memory matching games but never one where you're trying to find a particular card that your opponent has and they can shuffle those cards around if they want to so so that was quite interesting and unique and like I said the teenager I was playing with that was his favorite card game so he really had a great time playing that one uh, the climber and shedder from the base game is a very straightforward climber those are not my favorite kinds of trick takers, but this is a game where it keeps it simple by, you're not, you're not involving runs here. You're just two of a kind, three of a kind, four of a kind, or just single cards as you're trying to get rid of them. The extra wrinkle of having a field and a hand that you can't combine does complicate things and does make that a bit of a, a unique element, I guess I would say, to the climber and shutter mechanic. Uh, I liked, I think my favorite one, it wasn't necessarily the, the uh, Capture the Illusionist one, my favorite one I think was Treasure Island, and that's because I could, you know, you could steal loot from the other players, there was more of a take that focus I think in Treasure Island, but kind of a fun take that, it wasn't, it was never malicious in any of those games that we played, but you would be trying to target the leader, whoever had the most loot, you were trying to steal their loot from them or prevent them from winning more by forcing them to discard their better cards. Um, so that that one I think was my favorite again it was kind of a unique game and you got to push your luck a, a little bit but it's simple and quick to play you've got corgis on these cards that are dressed up as different warriors and wizards and that's kind of fun so the art style is good but are there are there downsides to clash of corgis there was one and it came up multiple times as we played this was the complaint about this game and that is you need to have the rules in front of you to remember what are the powers of each card. So we were passing around the table. I have, I'll be shuffling papers around here, but I, I, I'm printing up the rules and I've got here are all the card abilities for this version of the game. But they're all different, right? Because the rule sets are different. So it's very hard to keep straight. Uh, it, there's 11 cards in a suit. 
what are the abilities of all of those cards? Oh, now we're playing a different rule set. Now what are the abilities of these cards? Within the game, you could start to kind of get a handle on some of them, but they were hard to remember. There's no, and I mean by necessity, there's no other symbol of the on the cards other than the rank that would remind you of that card's ability. If you did that, I think it would be hard to play three different games with the cards. So uh, it's it's there's there's no graphics on the card other other than the rank and the suit and the picture of the cute corgi. There's nothing to give you a hint uh, about what these cards will do. So you need to have the rules and pass around that cheat sheet until maybe you play a bunch of games in a row with the same rule set, and then aha, now I remember what the number eight does. Now I remember what the nine does. That I think was true more for the Capture the Illusionist version of the game. We did find it was easier to kind of get a handle on the card abilities because we were using the same ability multiple times within one game. So, oh, I know the four will force him to reveal a card in, in the top row, or the eight is going to force him to turn all of his cards sideways so that he can't use any of his revealed ones on his next turn. Those were cards that we would remember they stuck out to us more because we were using the same ones over and over again. So your mileage may vary in terms of your memory for what all of these cards do. If your memory is really good, you're going to be able to keep it straight. But usually we're talking about games that you're going to play with kids, with your kids at home. And the younger ones certainly are going to need those reminders. And there's some reading that you saw. There's a couple of sentences underneath each one to kind of let you know what that card does. So until you've got a handle on all of those cards' abilities, you're passing the rules around and kind of reading, okay, I have an 8 and a 9 and a wild card in my hand. What do each of those do in order to decide how you're going to play the game? But otherwise, you know, we had a lot of fun, especially, I mean, the, the second two rule sets were a big hit with our group because we hadn't played anything like that before. So thanks so much to Derek for sending Clash of Corgis my way. I will put information about the game in the show notes below the video, but if you have any questions or comments, you can, of course, leave them in the comments section below the video, or you can email me at brian at brainsongames.ca. Brainsongames.ca is the website. That's where future episodes will go. The previous ones are already up there. Brains on Games is the X handle and the Facebook page and the Instagram feed. So we're all over the place. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to be notified of future ones, you can head on over to YouTube and click that subscribe button. Thanks for joining me and hopefully I'll see you next time.